Word nerd. Wordsmith. Wordy. Wordless. Oxford Dictionary says a word is a single, distinct, meaningful element of speech or writing, used with others or sometimes alone. We say each one matters. No extra words is literature, minimalist style. And we're getting you right to the story. Ben Ailing by Dave Barrett Ben Ailing sat hunched over the wheel of his Chrysler Grand Fury, inching his way down a long gravel alley in a rundown section of the Republic South Hills, past boarded-up brick houses and junked washers and dryers, looking for a sign of something familiar, wondering how in the hell he'd wound up here, of all places. He'd thought it had something to do with his boys. But then he'd remembered that all three had left town for the winter, Will finishing his senior year of college across state, Ben Jr. trading futures on the Nikkei market in far-off Singapore, and Jerry, his youngest, playing guitar with a rock and roll man somewhere in Texas. It was the second time in as many months he'd gotten lost driving around Republic like this, and he felt a little wave of panic welling up with the realization he might be experiencing the same early onset of dementia that had plagued his own mother near the end of her life. Ben hit the brakes midway down the alley and backed up the Chrysler. Something had caught his eye through a gate hanging wide open at the back of one of the houses. Leaving the engine idling, he stubbed his cigarette and stepped out of the car to investigate. I'll be damned, Ben muttered beneath his breath. In the waning light of a December afternoon, Ben identified the strange scurrying blotches of movement on the inch of fresh snow that blanketed the little backyard lawn and had first caught his attention. Pups! A half dozen or more newborn puppies were littered across the yard, blindly nosing through the snow like survivors of a plane wreck. Ben stepped up to the open gate, looking for the bitch, when a frail old woman wearing an oversized men's parka appeared from behind a wooden shed and called out to him. Can you help me, mister? The mother dog refuses these puppies. She bares her teeth and snaps at me. She's right here in the shed. The old woman's eyes were glassy with tears. Ben entered the yard and told her he would help. He asked her where she wanted the dog to be with the pups. Right here in the shed, the old woman answered. There isn't any room in the house. The bitch was lying on her side on a tattered sleeping bag just inside the open door of the shed. Ben thought she was a cross between a lab and a Doberman. She bared her teeth and growled at him. Ben spotted an old San Francisco 49er sweatshirt atop a stack of boxes and asked if he could borrow it. Yes, the old woman said. Use anything you like. Ben wrapped the thick sweatshirt around his left hand. Scooping the nearest pup out of the snow, he allowed the bitch to clamp down on his wrapped hand while he forced the first pup onto its mother's teat. He waited patiently until the dog slackened her bite on his hand and then repeated the process until all seven pups were reunited with their mother. That'll keep you busy, said Ben. When he stroked the top of the dog's head with his unwrapped hand, she no longer growled back. The old woman had left the yard and returned now with a small chains purse in her hands. She offered to pay Ben for his services, her gnarled fingers fumbling to unfurl a ten-dollar bill. Ben refused her. She asked him if he would like any food or drink, and he refused that as well. It best be going, Ben said. Forecast is for a good three inches of the white stuff tonight. Ben returned to the idling Chrysler. The first swirling flakes of the forecasted storm were already drifting out of the darkening sky. He'd intended on asking the old woman for directions, but his own sense of direction had returned while working with the pups. As he drove towards the downtown and the work awaiting him there, the restaurant accounts to balance, employees and customers to placate, deadlines to meet, Ben's mind wandered back to those pups, worming through the snow in search of their mother. And he thought that while this world is indeed one struggle after another, it is not without its joys. Hello there, welcome to No Extra Words, your flash fiction podcast. My name is Chris Baker-Dursch, I'm your producer and editor. Ben Ailing really sets up well 
what the stories in today's episode are going to talk about, which is basically being lost, doing a crappy job the best way you know how, and trying to move on from whatever took you to the place that you are. I love the parallel between Ben sort of navigating his world in which he may be aging, he may be losing his marbles, and he certainly is without all of his children, and this very lost dog who is rejecting all of her puppies because she's just so flustered and doesn't know what to do. I think it's always nice to remember that even in nature, sometimes those parenting relationships and those family relationships, even in the animal world, aren't all that they seem. I uh, was at a farm with my toddler and a group of toddler parents and we were watching the pigs and the mom pig just wanted to be left alone. All the babies are chasing her. They're trying to get her milk and she just wants to eat and you can see her just button them off and button them off and trying to get to the trough and get some food of her own and get a break from babies hanging on her. And my friends who are moms of young children just started laughing at that sight. And one of my friends kept asking, she said, where's the dad? And I, I said, I don't know. And we walked over to the edge of the pig pen and we found him buried in the straw with his head underneath everything, just completely ignoring this mother and her babies. We kind of had this laugh that, you know, these are relationships that for better or for worse play out in our lives too as parents of young children. The parent who wants to sleep late in the morning, the parent who's wrangling the little kids who just want to hang on them all day and who gets to fill what role at any given time. And it was reassuring somehow to know that that is something that happens in the animal world as well. But I digress. Today, that's why the theme of today is these places no one really wants to be and making the very best of them. And one of the things I love about all three of the stories you're hearing today is they have very specific settings. You can really feel where you are. I mean, think about Republic South Hills, which is this place that's described in Ben Ailing. You can see it. I mean, you can see what it looks like there. You can see what it feels like there. And yet it really has a universality to it. It could be anywhere, really. So that is what we are talking about today. And I am going to get you to the next two stories. Just a slight note. I'm not going to mark this episode as explicit, but the D-A-M-N word is used. um, And also the G-D word is used in the story coming up. So not, I would say not, not safe for television. But if you have um, small children around with you just be aware that that word is coming back around enjoy the two stories that are on their way to you and i will see you next time here on no extra words a sometimes kind wolf by cory wallace He smelled of old, unwashed underwear, socks, and dirt. I watched him stumble from his car and regain his footing by placing his palm flat against the hood. I fingered the gun beneath the register. Good evening, sir. He stared blankly toward me and dizzily strode to the beer cooler. I watched as he scanned the contents and warily picked up various six-packs, twelve-packs, and settled on a case. As I scanned the barcode, I recognized him. I turned my eyes away and felt the sting of his stench. I told him the amount, and he handed me a hundred-dollar bill. Keep the change, and do something with it for yourself while there is still time. He backed away from his space and pulled into traffic. I thought of my seventh birthday, and my mother smoking a cigarette on the porch and waiting for the car to come around the corner my brother keeping me occupied with a skateboard. Firewood by Frank Haberly The phone wakes you up. It's a guy named Marshall. He got your number from a guy named Ricky. You rub your eyes and yawn. 
You can't remember a guy named Ricky. But Marshall needs some firewood split for his wood stove. He hurt his goddamn back or something. He's willing to pay somebody fifty bucks to split a load of goddamned firewood. It just got delivered the night before. He needs it split before it got wet. He asks you if you know how to split firewood. He sounds out of breath. You picture this huge bear of a man, all beard and suspenders. Yes, you say. You have no idea how to split firewood, but you have a pretty good idea of what you can do with fifty bucks. So you say yes. You pull on your sweatshirt and pants and start walking. You walk all the way up to Marshall's house. You walk through the boarded up town. You walk past the little mill houses on the outskirts with wood smoke hugging the yards like little blankets. You start winding up the hill. It was once the side of a mighty volcano. The volcano popped out of the desert floor a million years ago, carving black ruts of lava in the sandstone. The houses are built into the sunny side of the hill, multi-leveled, made of exotic woods. Or they are those terracotta jobs, with those red pipe tiles they use for roofing out here. The houses have neat, arty little mailboxes. The yards are terraced with pink desert plants and blue cactus, tucked into little white rock gardens. Up here you are above the smoky, out-of-work little mill town. It is warmer up here than down there. But it is still cold. You find Marshall's house number on his mailbox. You walk up and ring the doorbell. A lady comes to the door. She doesn't unlatch it. She speaks to you through the storm window. She holds a huge coffee mug in her left hand. Oh my, she says. Marshall left the mall and the sledge in the back. She wraps the fingernails of her right hand on the storm window pane in front of you. So you'll just want to go around back. Just follow that path around the garage to go around back. There's a pile of logs right there in the back. You'll want to stack up the wood by the back door. Marshall's just gone to the store for a minute. She looks you over for a moment. Steam forms on the glass in front of her. You wonder if she might offer you a mug of coffee. So, she said, you'll probably want to get started. From the backyard, the sky opens up to the mountains, spinning away in a row of snowy rounded bulbs, laced in a wisp of morning fog. Huge old pine trees tangle against each other, clawing the slopes. The town is now far away, behind the houses, below me. This is all right, you think. You pick up a solid round log in your arms and wrestle it onto a flat stump scarred from earlier. You pick up a thing that looks like an axe and swing it into a crack in the top of the log. So far, so good, you think. You pick up a thing that looks like a sledgehammer. You spit in the palms of your hands because you think you are supposed to. You can feel the lady's eyes bearing down on you through the curtain somewhere in the huge house behind you. You pick the sledge up over your shoulder. You swing it, putting all your weight into it, every pound of energy you can muster, your legs, your back, the bulgy things in your neck, all coming down in this wild swinging arc. And it comes down, and you miss the axe head. The sledge bangs on the semi-frozen tree stump. A bolt of pain shoots up your arms into your forehead. Oh my, you hear through the curtains behind you. Oh dear, does he even know what he's doing? Does he even... And then there is silence. She's right, you think. I can't even do this. I can't even split a piece of goddamn firewood. What am I doing here, you think, wiping your cracked lips on your sleeve? Who am I trying to kid? You stare off at the mountains for a second, that sweet, clean line of snowy peaks, that tangled path that clears when the snow melts, winding its way back to all that once was. And you think of the fifty bucks, and what it will buy you here and now. Fifty bucks isn't a bus ride home, but fifty bucks is a bag of groceries, a used winter coat at the Goodwill down there. You spit in your hands again, pick up the sledge. You take another swing, softer this time. It rings off the axe blade like a bell. A second shot, and the log splits even. Then quarters. Then eighths. Then another log. Fifty bucks, you say to yourself, setting the axe blade. Fifty bucks. The sun rises high behind you. Logs to sticks. Logs to sticks. Water drips from the roof from your face. The wood grows softer, lighter. You are just about to swing again when a voice speaks behind you. Well, I'll be goddamned, it says. You turn to face a tiny little old man with a beard and suspenders, leaning on a cane and patting the huge stack of firewood by his door. And you say, you must be Marshall. 
Thanks for listening to the No Extra Words podcast. For more information on today's stories and contributors, or to learn how to submit your own work, please visit us at noextrawords.wordpress.com. The best support you can give the show is to recommend us to your family and friends. See you next time.